Hi, everybody. Gene Valentino here with a guest that I'd love to have you meet in a minute. Welcome to another edition of Gene Valentino's Grassroots Truth Casts. We do these uh, impromptu uh, interviews with guests that come our way. And what better place to do it uh, than in Gino's uh, airplane hangar? This is the home of the Icon A5, which sits here in the hangar here at our home in Pensacola, Florida. Welcome, everybody. Glad you're able to join us. I think we're going to run around 30 minutes. I'd like to introduce you to Paul uh, Entrecken. But Paul is, uh, well, I don't know how to describe him. Let me just tell you, I had the privilege of being a uh, citizen pilot in the pre-show of the Blue Angels Air Show this past uh, uh, summer, uh, 2022, here in Pensacola, Florida. As you know, this is the home of the Blue Angels, uh, the Blue Angels flight team, a revered, honored team since almost the beginning of air show time. The Blue Angels have been historically anchored here in Pensacola, Florida. And in the process of uh, meeting my dear friend, who's also a radio broadcaster who's doing the uh, narrations for the Blue Angels, he says, you need to get involved with the pre-show at the Blue Angels Air Show. And I'm introduced through the by phone to Paul Entrecken. Is that correct? Entrecken. 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 There you go. Excuse me. And Paul has been um, in aviation his whole life. Now the flight boss for the Blue Angels Air Show. But prior to that, Paul was uh, an aviator now to this day with over 30,000 hours of flight experience. Uh, I'd like to tell you 20 years of it was with Delta, but the real story with Paul is what it, we're gonna talk about today in the course of things. This is his book, Mr. Mig, the, the real story of the first MiGs in America. Yes, a Ru Russian aircraft. Paul is the owner of the first Russian aircraft owned outside of the military personally for personal use and was uh, uh, flying it here in the United States. Quite a story. Paul, welcome. Thank you for joining it's us. It's a pleasure to be I'll here, Gino. Rewind the tape, brother. Tell me what, I'm, what I missed. There's a whole history. There's a ton of things I wanna talk about. I don't know where to begin. His, his out of aviation life is as interesting to me as uh, everything in aviation. Uh, great backdrop here for us. Um, Absolutely. We love being around uh, Avgas and jet fuel. It's in our veins, isn't it? <laughs> There's a nice whiff to it. Yes. yes <laughs> as indeed. long as it keeps me sober up there, I'm okay. <laughs> but tell me, let, before we begin on the book, and uh, tell me about the history that brought you to Pensacola and your flight brought boss, where you ended up after Delta here as a flight boss for the Blues. Okay. I'll, I'll start at the start, uh, not all the way back, but I'll start at my time at Auburn. I, I thought I was going to be a music major, and I showed up at Auburn thinking that that's what I wanted to do, and it was apparent in my first quarter that I was not a good fit for that. So I thought, well, what am I going to change my major to? And I ended up essentially changing it to football. Huh? I was a band kid. I, I ran track and played baseball in high school. Uh, wanted to play football. I'd played peewee football, but you can't be in the marching band and on the football team. So I get to Auburn. I had auditioned for the band. I'd been accepted. And then the band director said, well, I hate to tell you this, but I've had some guys come back from graduate school on the drum line, so I don't have a place for you. And that was back in the day before they had kids out there holding ladders and they, they'd find a place to put, put band kids. So I thought, wow, this is really bad. I'm a music major and I can't even make the marching band. I went to a freshman football practice, sat there and shot my mouth off about how this guy couldn't hit and that guy was too slow. And after a while, this fellow that I was with said, if you think you could do any better, why don't you walk on the football team? And I said, well, I just might do that. He said, no, you won't. So, well, watch this. So I go see the, uh, the freshman football coach. I'd like to walk on the football team. He said, where'd you go to school? I said, Decatur High School. He said, weren't you guys the 4A state champions last year? I said, yes, sir, we were. He said, okay, what position? And I went, uh, I'd be a pretty good punt returner, I think, I'm fast. He goes, well, we need some defensive backs, okay. Here's a chit, give this to the equipment guy and we'll see it practice tomorrow. So I'm making a short story long, but I ended up walking on the football team. I made it. Uh, there's a good backstory as to uh, 
my conversation with the coach a couple of weeks later, but I won't, won't bore you with that. Anyway, I ended up sticking around for four years. I lettered as a defensive back at Auburn wow. playing football. Uh, majoring in football, I got out, decided I didn't want to teach and coach, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I absolutely stumbled on the military. So grateful uh, that some folks guided me in the right direction. I took the test uh, for aviation, never having dreamed that I could possibly be a military aviator. Passed those. Uh, Went to officer candidate school. And then after that, Marines go through a six month training called the basic school, came down here to Pensacola and started flight school. Absolutely fell in love with aviation. I just couldn't believe it. I pinched myself every day. That's tough. Getting those wings of gold is not easy, but I absolutely loved it. My career in the Marine Corps, I was so blessed. I got to fly helicopters. I got to fly jets. I got to fly turboprops. Wow. A little bit of everything and just had a blessed career. He became a flight instructor. I was that. an instructor at it, Whiting, uh, teaching folks how to fly, which was one of my favorite tours. I loved that, flying the T-34 Charlie. Uh -huh. It was great. And then uh, when I decided to get out of the Marine Corps, I got in the air show business. And that's how I stumbled on the MIG. So you came out of the Marine Corps flying and you got you became part of the air show. Uh, they call you the flight boss now? I'm the air boss. Air boss. Air boss. Okay. That's right. I had. Uh, and what's your what's your duty of it? Well, with my experience as an air show performer, I, I flew the MIG full time for three years before I was hired by Delta. And then my air show flying became an avocation, but I was going to an air show briefing you know, just about every weekend and listening to an air boss who is the, the ringmaster. He's the guy yeah. that directs the orchestra. Yeah. Uh, he controls the airspace, so to speak, and makes sure that there aren't two people flying at the same time that aren't supposed to be. Uh, he keeps the sterile airspace safe. That's so as the air boss, that's my job. And that's what I do at the Pensacola Beach Air Show every year. I always remember the days when I first came to town some 30 years ago from the West at 400 nautical miles per hour, <laughs> descending to 300 feet, <laughs> you know, it'd be the air, air the air instructor uh, talking through it. And I was in awe watching these machines come past us. And this being the home of the Blue Angels and uh, the cradle of naval aviation. Many people don't realize this is the cradle of Navy in naval aviation. I take this aircraft uh, up in the air behind me and I go up um, a Perdido Bay here and I see some old, old signs of the ramps coming out of the water. What an interesting, that's from a day gone by. That's right. What was flying back then that was using those ramps? They had PBYs and it was the place, uh, Pensacola, uh, was the place for these seaplanes to be kept and maintained. So as you said, they had those beautiful yeah. ramps where they could just pull them right out of the water, kind of like here at your place, and put uh, them in those giant hangars. Coming out of New England and moving south 30 years ago, coming into the cradle of Navy, naval aviation and going to the Naval Museum, I get a tour that is second to none it's it's a three day experience. It it pale it, it, the the Smithsonian pales in comparison to what's right here in our backyard. I sure wish they'd market it more because this is America's best kept secret. This cradle of na naval aviation exemplified in history in the context of history uh, right here at the uh, Naval Museum, which is a juxt to the uh, blues that pull right up to the big panoramic windows of the museum. It's really a tribute to the Blue Angels and uh, the history that's uh, preceded us here in this town. So good for you. That takes us up to you going into Delta, coming out of Delta, and then being uh, the flight boss, the air boss for uh, the Blues. Um, uh, what What is the role now? What are you doing in, in I think you and I are nearly the same age. What's the, uh, what's the role here over the next 10 years in terms of the future of the Blue Angels? Wow, that's, that's a great question. Uh, as you're aware, they, uh, this coming season, they will have their first female flying with the, uh, the diamond. With the diamond. Uh, with the diamond. Of course, they've been on, in military in service for, oh, some, yeah, yeah, for over is. a decade. From and they've already had uh, one gal that was flying uh, Fat Albert 
the C-130, but this will be the first girl that's flying a uh, one of the fighters. And so it's gonna be a really, really special year coming up for the Blues. Um, they've already transitioned to the Super Hornet. So they've got the, uh, the mount that they're gonna be using for the next few years. But every team has its own personality. Uh, they, they sort of follow the boss's lead in a lot of ways, including uh, personality wise. But I, I've been, uh, been the air boss for the Pensacola Beach Air Show. This coming season will be my 30th year being oh, wow. the air boss out there. Um, I'm proud to say that when I was an instructor, uh, five of my students went on to become Blue Angels. Wow. Uh, I've, I've flown a practice show with the team and uh, participate in the Blue Angels Association. And I just love being around the guys and seeing them transition every couple of years with the new personalities. Wow. But their future is very, very bright. Uh, the Blue Angels aren't going away. And our country is so fortunate to have them, the Thunderbirds, uh, that they, they just... The, fantastic representatives of what our nation is all about. It, rep it also reflects our, uh, our technology and our advances and our disciplines. The thing I appreciate most is which when I've had the privilege of meeting you is your attention to not only the, uh, the technology and the, uh, the uh, aviation industry in general, but your attention to the, the youth that are coming up through the ranks and helping them find their way in a, into this industry. Very much, some stumble into it, like you said, you did, but others uh, who beg to be part of it are now in it and they're looking up to leaders. Putting aside the politics of what, uh, what's going on in the world today, I'm amazed at how the Blues and the NAS Pensacola and the industry, Navy, Naval Aviation in general has has uh, maintained its discipline. And uh, it, there's no compromise when you're up there flying that aircraft. I mean, you still have to be disciplined under pressure to manage it uh, with the intensity it requires. Are you seeing the same character and talent coming up through the ranks? Well, yes and no. Um, it's, uh, it's become, I think, a little more difficult um, for military flight training because the uh, some of the folks that are coming into the program these days are not accustomed to that strict discipline that's necessary for for proper flying. Uh, so it's uh, I think the learning curve is possibly a little bit steeper. But whoever came up with the idea of uh, the National Flight Academy, wow, uh, what a great way to immerse kids in what can be expected if they decide to choose naval aviation or any type of aviation as a career. It's a great exposure for them to see that in this uh, society these days where everybody gets a trophy, some things you still have to work really, really hard for. And getting those wings of gold is one of those things that you have to work really hard for. Folks, we're talking with Paul Entrican, flight boss, air boss, excuse me, air boss for the uh, Blue Angels Air Show for some 30 years. He's been doing it here in Pensacola. He's now the author of Mr. Mig. We're going to get to this book in, in a minute. Uh, but what he was talking about with the uh, Flight Academy and um, at the museum was, uh, you know, it's amazing our paths didn't cross because I was county commissioner between 2006 and 2014. And during that period of time, uh, we had put together a funding package for the museum for about $30 million uh, that was funded through grants and other uh, funding sources, but from the county to support our NAS Pensacola folks and uh, the, the Blues in, in specifically. Uh, this flight academy is second to none. Uh, the USS Ambition, I love telling the story, I'll digress for just a second. So the kids come into this USS ambition, you're getting this, the sense that you're being immersed uh, in this total immersion into an aircraft carrier. And when you do that, you all of a sudden lose your focus about missing mommy and daddy for a week. <laughs> That's right. And the ki kids are now under a squadron leader, I guess, of sorts. And um, they are immersed into a full opportunity of 
aviation and naval experiences for a full five nights, six days. And uh, I would ask you to get online. Paul can help direct you to the right links in a minute to show you where you can go to learn more about the Flight Academy, uh, the USS Ambition. And uh, 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 this is a great way for them to get an experience that hopefully becomes an ultimate student of yours, if not uh, an, a Blue Angel pilot. Talk more about the, um, about, uh, 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 the, uh, the Blues and your role there going forward in the future. And then let's talk about the book. Well, as, as long as the Santa Rosa Island Authority will have me as the air boss, I, I plan to continue to do that. Uh, the International Council of Air Shows now has uh, facilitated a program with the FAA that all air bosses now have to have a letter of authorization, meaning you can't just go out and tap the local weatherman from the TV station to come out and be your air boss. Uh, the air boss has to have certain credentials. And they, they want folks that, that know a little bit about air traffic control, a little bit about flying airplanes. Uh, it, you have to be well-versed in all aspects of aviation to be the air boss to assure that, uh, that safety is maintained out there. So I plan on maintaining that affiliation with the Blues for as long as the Island Authority will have me as the air boss. I now see how, uh, the, how and why the military uh, fits so well with the uh, citizenry of the community, uh, the public at large, because there is a beautiful transition, uh, a very friendly one indeed, between uh, military discipline and strength of operation and character uh, and maintaining that uh, for safety first, but also enjoy uh, welcoming the public at large. 150,000 people just coming off this COVID crisis we've been through the last two years, 150,000 people on Pensacola Beach just two months ago. This is unbelievable. I, I, I can't believe it. And uh, no incidents, a safe flight for all. And um, the community uh, welcomes it each year. They're closing up their uh, show in November. And I understand a ruling's just come out as to how it's going to, the season's going to close. It's going to be at the base. That's right. It's going to be back at the base after a couple of years. And that's going to be wonderful. Uh, the Blues want to have their homecoming show at their base, and it's just so appropriate that it's finally going to be back there, that the Department of the Navy has finally figured out how they're going to handle security issues, and they'll be welcoming uh, any and all civilians out for the air show. It's going to be a very, very special opportunity, so I hope that people will come out uh, it's the second weekend in November, I think. No pre-show flights for me this at that time, right? <laughs> I don't think. I think that's verboten since it's going to be on the base anyway. <laughs> that's right. But, but hint, hint. I wouldn't mind flying over there. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> that's a joke. I would. I would certainly go where I'm welcome to. Uh, but um, so one of these days soon, I'd like to get you in the seat over here with me. And I'm ready. I'm strapped in. Let's would, go. Would you like to do that? Absolutely. With me? I love flying airplanes. Bring your GoPro and let's get some video for another, another episode. Maybe. Yeah, let's do that. Um, okay. Switching topics. Tell me about Mr. Mig. Uh, before you do, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think any American has been able to get ownership of a Russian military aircraft the way you did. Is, tell the story. That's how this book is, what this book's all about. That's right. That's right. Give us the, uh, the, the tease. Okay. Uh, I was very, very fortunate, as you said, to be the first civilian in the world to own and operate a Russian jet fighter. And that came about because after I transitioned from my military career to getting into the air show business with my pits, I had a Pitts S2B, beautiful little Pitts special. Uh, a friend of mine who was a snowbird, flight flew for the Canadian snowbirds, had contacted me and said, hey, Paul, I read in Canadian Aviation Magazine that a, there's a guy up here in Canada that's going to import some MiG-17s. Man, if you could get a hold of one of those, you could write your own ticket in the air show business. And we had a laugh and said, yeah, right. There's going to be MiGs flying around. Sure, there will. But I thought, it's only going to cost me a phone call. So I call this guy. And sure enough, he's legitimate. Uh, he's of Chinese ancestry. He has contacts in China. Uh, our State Department has just normalized relations with China. 
And he's going to bring five at the time. At the time, he's going to bring five of these jets over. He's going to bring them into the states because it's illegal to bring them into Canada. Huh. So he told me what he's going to do and what his plan was. And the next question I had was, "How about maintenance? Got to be able to maintain these airplanes." He said, "You're on your own for maintenance." I went, like, "Ooh, okay. Well, how am I going to handle that?" So I go to the old Rolodex and I'm flipping through there and. I saw a name. Uh, I'd been to the Combat Jet and Aerospace Museum out in Chino, California. And it's a fascinating place. They have T-33s and F-86s and Mustangs and Corsairs and all kinds of wonderful aircraft out there. So I called this guy up and said, hey, Bruce, if I were to have a MiG-17, do you think that's an aircraft that you could maintain? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, it's very, very similar to an F-86. And I'm thinking to myself, I wonder how he knows that. And he said, but, but why do you want to get a MiG-17? And I said, well, that's what's available. And he said, well, a MiG-15 would be better. I said, well, yeah, why is that? He said, well, it's got a little more history maybe and uh, doesn't have an afterburner, a little easier to maintain. I said, well, that's all well and good, Bruce, but where am I going to find one of those? He said, well... I just happen to have five of them sitting on the dock in Long Beach right now. You're kidding. Getting ready to go through customs. And I said, really? He said, yep. I said, well, we need to talk. Next thing I know, I'm on an airplane going out to California. We go out and he has contacts that actually let us into this sterile area in customs. He takes a mechanic with him. We open up one of the crates. And sure enough, there's a MiG-15 in there with the guns on it. Oh, boy. And I have to tell you, Bruce didn't have a firearms importation license. And he had <laughs> told the Chinese, before you ship the jets, take the guns off. They didn't do that. So oh, boy. I see this look of fear in his eyes, and he's going, oh, crap. When these things go through customs, we're going to be in trouble. This is what we did. And I'm not kidding, folks. We really, really did this took the end off every one of those five crates. The mechanic already knew how to crank down the gun mechanisms, took the guns off the aircraft, cranked the belly back up, put the crates back together again, and tagged each one of the gun mechanisms and said, this one's going to the uh, Air Force Museum in Dayton. This one's going to the Marine Corps Museum in Quantico. This one's going to the Smithsonian, and so on and so on. So Bruce was off the hook for having these guns oh, that, that came in with the jets. But anyway, make this uh, short story a little bit long. We did a deal. He said, I'm just thrilled that you're going to be displaying this thing on the air show circuit because the first question everybody's going to have is, where did you get it? And I'm going to say, I got it from him, and he's got four more. Oh, my word. Because he wanted to sell his airplanes. But that's how I stumbled across So you're jet. the first, and there's four others somewhere in the United States. There are, uh, I flew uh, one of the sister ships that eventually uh, belonged to a guy named Jim Robinson out of Houston. He donated that airplane to the EAA. So it's up as, at Oshkosh right now, as far as I know. Uh, one went to the Champlin Museum and there are two others in museums somewhere that never flew. So only two of the five ever flew to my knowledge. And I don't know if any are still flying today. Wow. Is yours still active? It's not. I, I actually sold my aircraft. I was going to donate it to the Naval Aviation Museum here, but because of a happenstance sequence of events, that, that never happened. So I ended up selling the jet. And unfortunately, the guy that I sold it to had a mishap in the aircraft. He didn't destroy it, but he damaged it badly enough that the insurance company took it back and sold it for parts and pieces. Oh, boy. So it was a very sad ending to a very historic aircraft. Wow. And, and all the uh, guns ended up elsewhere? Uh, the guns are all in museums. Uh, mine are in the Smithsonian. I was oh, able my. to track them down, and I know that they're in the Smithsonian on display. Uh, we put replica gun barrels in, in my jet, so it looked like it had the, the big 37-millimeter cannon on one side, and the 223 millimeters on the other, which is gun barrels. Wow. We're talking with Paul Enterkin, air boss of the uh, uh, Blue Angels Air Show. He's been uh, 
doing it for over 30 years and hopefully another 30. I hope so. <laughs> We've had a great time talking today about not only the history of aviation and where you fit in with it here in Pensacola, fellow Pensacola resident like myself, but also with, um, with uh, 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 what you've done with the aircraft, the, the MiG. I want to replug this Please get it. And how can they get this book? It's available on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble, any place that the books are sold. You can find it online very easily. And it's available in an Audible book right now. Is it? It's really, really nicely done. Uh, the person that voices the book is uh, a dear friend who's an air show announcer named Rob Ryder. Uh, he did a great job with the Audible book. Called Mr. Mig. Uh, the Real Story of the First Migs in America by Paul Entrican. Uh uh, air boss here at the Blue Angels, 30,000 hours of flight time, some of it with Delta, uh, an array of aircraft that uh, uh, some of the names, I don't even know what they are, uh, that he has flown uh, uh, in and out of training for the youth coming through the system uh, here in the Pensacola area uh, and all of the training involved in our area fields. What a great honor to have this time with you uh, doing this. Um, let's talk about a few in the last few minutes. Uh, let's talk about some of your other. I've got a dossier of things you've been doing your whole life. After you left Auburn, you, you and I are 1976. So we're about the same age. I was coming out of Connecticut when you were coming out of Auburn. And um, during that period of time, you found your way through all sorts of aviation experiences. But I'm also interested in something else. You became not only a scoutmaster, but very high ranking in the uh, Boy Scouts of America. What an honorable organization. You seem to f hang around things that have um, youth and youth inspiration, helping them with their aspirations in their, um, in their own life journey. You wanna make any correlation to your history versus how you found yourself helping the Boy Scouts of America? Absolutely. Uh, one of the traits that I think you and I share in common as we talked about earlier is servant leadership. There's a calling that tugs on our heartstrings to be servant leaders. And as a, as a boy, I, I was immersed in scouting. I absolutely loved it, became an Eagle Scout. And I knew that at some point later on in my adulthood, that I would try to give back in scouting, to scouting in some way. And with my boys both being in scouting, one of which also became an Eagle, it was very easy to get back into scouting as a leader. And the opportunities are there. You just, you don't even have to look for them. And if you have any type of leadership ability, you're going to get tapped to move up as from scoutmaster to district chairman, to working on the council executive board. There are lots of different opportunities out there. And if you have a passion for mentoring young people, as, as you and I do, that it was just a perfect fit. And so I was thrilled. I uh, went to Philmont, took, uh, took boys out there on contingents, went to the National Jamboree, just absolutely loved being a scout. You leader. did this during the whole uh history of air boss work as well. That's right. that's right. So these kids must have known about your air boss experience. They did. They did. They, they knew that I was Mr. Mig and that, uh, but you know, when you're that close to it, it's not as impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Although some of them ended up in the flight Academy or ended up in aviation or ended up as a blue angel. No? That's right. That's right. As a matter of fact, about two days ago, I got an email from a young man that I was in scouting with who is now a Lieutenant Commander in the Navy. He flies helicopters and he was letting me know that they're gonna be doing a static display at the homecoming air show and wanted to make sure that I came by to visit with him. So it's very rewarding to see some of these young people come up and have, you know that they listened and they learned and uh, it's just a real button buster to make you feel proud to see what they're doing. Are these graduates showing up at the Blue Angel air shows and bumping into you there? Yes, as a matter of fact, as the air boss, I'm up on this scissor lift up in the air, and it's not uncommon for one to walk by and say, hey, Mr. E, how you doing? And it's just, it's just wonderful. I absolutely love that. You have a, a great following, and um, uh, how, can I, how can I describe you? 
still waters run deep. How's that? <laughs> this is a guy who's probably your actions have spoken louder than your words. Your words are very humbling, but your actions uh, bespeak your, your words. And I am so honored to have been able to do this 30 minute show with you on Gene Valentino's Grassroots Truthcast. This week, every week, we try to find interesting individuals from various walks of life to talk about those unique happenings. And if you uh, think you fit the mold, <laughs> why don't you give us a call or contact us through www.genevalentino.com. You'll find, find our newscasts there, the 15 minute political oriented, social political oriented commentaries vignettes uh, broken down into maybe 15 minute segments for your uh, listening pleasure. But for your viewing pleasure, we do these uh, once a week as well to uh, bring in people from various walks of life. Let's hope that the next Blue Angels Air Show has some of those uh, graduates. Let's hope. From the, uh, from the Air Boss's uh, 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 flight uh, experiences that you've had in, in this area. Um, Paul Entrican. Many thanks for being with us. Semper Fidelis, my friend. Uh, Semper Fidelis to you, although I was not a great Marine. So <laughs> I hope I said it correctly. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, having I, me. I, 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 we got a rain check for this right behind me. Got it. Let's do, uh, let's do a low flight, slow flight, splash and go in front of that casino beach uh, area. Folks, by the way, the air show that um, uh, uh, the video we did is in the pre-show of the Blue Angels Air Show, where I had the privilege of meeting uh, Paul. And uh, you can go to genevalentino.com. It's the red, white, and blues tag we have on it. The same video team that did the video for the Blue Angels happened to have some free footage and they sent it my way. It turned out to be a nice three minute segment of this Icon aircraft at uh, water level up to about 600 feet in and around the hot box of the Blue Angels Air Show this past July of uh, 2022. Uh, again, thank you for joining us for another edition of Gene Valentino's Grassroots Truthcast. Until we meet again. <laughs>